The session you're in is concurrent session one, breeding for a changing climate. Uh, and uh, you obviously enjoyed afternoon tea, which is great. Uh, I avoided the, uh, the cream, so I perhaps didn't get as many carbs as you did. Uh, my name is Forbes Bryan. Uh, I'm a local here from South Australia, work with the University of Adelaide, uh, and uh, we most recently ran a, uh, a ABG conference from Adelaide, uh, which was basically a hybrid of online and small meetings around Australia and New Zealand. Ironically, this was the room we were supposed to originally meet in uh, back in August last year. We eventually changed the date to November, still at the convention centre, and then unfortunately had to uh, pull stumps and go online and hybrid. So, and we thank very much to the Adelaide Convention Centre for giving all, all our money back, which was great. So I can't speak too highly of the place. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, this session and also the first speaker, uh, Professor Richard Eckard. Uh, in the notes for today, you'll notice a CV for each of the speakers, so I won't read those out verbatim, but I just want to tell you a few things about Richard. Firstly, he, he, was, he developed the first greenhouse gas accounting tools uh, in Australia for agriculture, and his research provided the basis for six carbon offset methods in Australia. So obviously a very fundamental uh, bit of work there, Richard, and thanks very much for, for all your efforts. And we're, with, with pleasure, I invite you forward to give your address today. Thank you. What we know about climate change now and into the future. Thanks, Marish. Very much, Forbes. Uh, we realise we know each other from at least 20 years ago. Sorry about that. Um, but uh, yeah, what do we know about climate change now and in the future? And uh, right at the beginning, I need to confess that I know lots about carbon farming. I know lots about climate change. I know very little about breeding. So when it comes to the end where I'm sort of making some very naive suggestions about what we need, uh, please be uh, kind to me. Uh, I'm quite glad Rob Banks is not here because he and I don't agree about breeding for methane. Um, so we'll see where we go. Um, I, I thought I'd start with the framework of the three P's of climate change because often um, when we're dealing with a subject as complex as climate change, uh, you've got to break it down into, well, what are we talking about? And there's the physical side of climate change, which is a challenge in its own right from a breeding point of view. Then I throw in the policy implications of climate change, which are quite different again because that's really saying, well, there's a mitigation imperative coming out of um, the uh, COP21 agreement and there's border adjustment tariffs and things like that that we need to consider where that fits into our production system. And then that sort of flows on to, well, what's the future consumer want? Where's the consumer preference going? What is our markets going to look like in the future and how do we prepare for them under a changing climate? Um, and often we get hung up on the physical and we forget that actually the policy and the people side of the equation could actually be more imminent and more real for us as producers than you know, a 2030 or 2050 climate. Um, so let's break it down um, on that basis. So we, we know that growing season rainfall in southern Australia has been declining steadily o over the last 20 years. For I really interesting that you don't find official statements coming out saying we had a step change in the year 2000 at the beginning of the millennium drought. But we're starting to see the Bureau of Meteorology now actually admit that actually we did have a step change. It's just that in climate science, you need at least 30 years of sequence before you can make any statement about a change in climate. Um, but it seems that that's, that's what's coming out now. In northern Australia, a lot, a lot less clear. Um, the noise in rainfall signals up there is just so high uh, that we don't really know. And a lot of scientists would say that that Kimberley region is getting more rain because of more forest burning in Indonesia, bringing ash over and creating more rainfall as a result. So actually, it might not be climate change. It might just be an indirect effect. But here's a nice sequence of two slides. So watch, I'll switch between the two slides, and it shows you what the rainfall zones of Australia were and what they, gained, what they have been in the last 15 years. So it's... it's uh, uh, the, the historical record from 1900. Now, I'll, I'll switch between them a few times. 
Um, but imagine you were producing in Holbrook. So get yourself on Wagga or Holbrook and then watch as you switch to the next one. Basically, all the weather systems have moved about four to 800 kilometers south. And so if you were a farmer in Holbrook when you bought the property 40 years ago, it would have been a winter dominant rainfall. Um, and now it's actually 50-50. You've got half the rain in summer, but less effective because of higher evaporation um, than in winter where there's you know, obviously a more effective rainfall. So I'll switch that again. And if you, you look, at, look at if you at uh, Mount Sterling in Western Australia, for example, um, you know, if, if Bathurst's weather moves down to Wagga and down to Holbrook and down to Albury, it's probably not as bad as if Kalgoorlie's weather is headed towards um, the southwest corner. Um, so in some cases, not all bad news. But this summarizes what's really happened. And if you look at this as the rainfall anomalies, the high and low rainfall years around the long-term average. And that last 20-year period is definitely all below the line, except for known La Nina events where we know we get more rainfall. Um, so I, th I think it's, it's definitely something ha happening there. Uh, we did an analysis of all the uh, grain production sites from the subtropics right around the country through the temp winter rainfall zones up into the tropics again. And basically, what we have seen in the last 20 years in the grains industry is pretty much the red bars that you can see in all those graphs that you can't read, um, which is what we would have suggested might have happened by 2030 through to 2050 as an outcome, is what we've actually had in the grains industry in the last 20 years. Um, now, I, I've thrown this in even though it's viticulture, but I, I think it's really important because the viticulturists keep impeccable records. And so what we did in this study is we went to all the vineyards that had kept daily sugar readings of the vines leading up to harvest and had recorded field by field of what the sugar concentrations were and the dates by which those were achieved. And we put all that together into a, a large scale analysis from the 1950s onwards and basically concluded that ideal vintage dates in the viticulture industry have increased by eight days per decade towards the, the summer. So it presents them with, with a number of problems. One, vintage compression, which means you don't have enough stainless steel to process, but it also means that it's a very clear warming of spring temperatures that have advanced vine development. Now, I mention that because we've, we've got to look at industries that have got good data to say what's going on because we, in the grazing industry, work in an industry where the indicators come back at us a bit slower. Um, and that's why I throw these in. So we did look at pasture production under a changing climate. And this is in 2009, and we had some predictions of what say perennial ryegrass in this case in Gippsland would look like in 2030 and 2070. Then we decided, um, I'll just go on to the next slide. What we decided is, uh, that was in 2009. So in 2020, we went back and said what had actually happened in the last 20 years. And that's the difference between the blue and the red bar. And so we concluded that actually what's our, our lived experience since, uh, since the year 2000 has actually been more like what we originally predicted would only happen somewhere between 2030 and 2050 in terms of pasture growth. It's not a disaster because you know, we, 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 presume, we present that to producers and they say, well, yes, if we know that's the pattern of production, we can cope with it. But it does mean that we've got to start thinking about what production systems we'd be looking at in the future. We then also looked at what can we do about it? Would, would just breeding, breeding plants with deeper roots get us out of trouble? And so we looked very fairly naively at that and, and had three different rooting depths on, on identical pastures. This is a modeling exercise and said, well, at a high rainfall zone like Hamilton, uh, would that be an advantage? And yes, we found a greater shoulder. If you look at the red, there's a greater shoulder on the edge of the season. So we extended the growing season out by breeding for a plant with deeper roots. On the right hand side, when we took that inland into a more rainfall challenged area, what we found is it just dried down the soil profile earlier and we ended up with less production from deeper roots. So clearly, some adaptations work in some areas and some breeding targets might work, but not in, in others. Um, so if you're inland, you might need to look at um, a, uh, a plant that goes summer dormant for longer uh, rather than a deeper rooted plant to ensure perennially. And so what we know in southeastern Australia and in western Australia is it's generally the change in the pattern of pasture growth is highly correlated with a decrease in spring rainfall um, and a uh, gradual increase in spring temperatures leading to more evaporation towards the end of the, end of the growing season. Now, I've also thrown in a little uh, indication of 
heat stress in animals. Um, this was an interesting study where we, we got all the daily milk tanker pickup data from all the dairy companies in southeastern Australia and put it together in, in a sequence. So the blue line is the average of all the milk tanker pickups from a 15-year period. And then we just picked out 20, January 2014 as a known heat wave event. Now, why do I present that to this audience? Because milk production is one of your most sensitive indicators you've got of animal stress in heat. And so if you don't have that indicator, you know, live weight gain measured on a monthly basis is really not going to pick it up. Whereas you can see very clearly here, the whole state of Victoria lost 14% milk production from a four-day heat, heat stress event. Clearly those animals were, were, were heat stressed and there was a delayed recovery. So I think that's an indicator that something can be done. Um, now, interesting enough, when we picked individual uh, dairy farms that were applying the Cool Cows program, they only lost 1% production in that same event. So clearly the management can work around this. But what it allowed us to do is put it all together into a collective picture that says, what would the whole southeastern Australian region look like under a 1.5 degree centigrade change? Now, it's too complicated for us to go through, but this is what we actually need to start doing, is reconciling land use under a changed climate and say, well, there's opportunities for the red meat industry for greater kakuyu production in the far east of Gippsland because we're getting more summer rain, uh, for example, just to give you one example. Um, in terms of Pinot Noir, well, they all headed to Tasmania anyway. Um, but, but in terms of livestock production, we might see uh, cropping moving south in western Victoria, but sheep production moving back up into traditional drier zones in a wheat-sheep combination. Um, all right, that's the physical side. I, I thought I'd switch on to the policy implications and then the people and just end off with where this leads, leaves us. So what we know is the Paris Climate Agreement for the first time set the world on a course towards climate neutrality. Now note they said climate, not carbon neutrality. We've assumed carbon neutrality, but there is a fundamental difference. Under climate neutrality, methane doesn't have to be zero. If you look at the New Zealand target, it's about 40% less, not zero methane by 2050. So that's an imp important point. But COP26, what it did is increased short-term ambition. It actually said, let's not just have a 2050 target, let's have a 2030 target. Now, why does that matter? Because I'll show you a few reasons why we should care and why CN30 is, uh, is a reasonable strategy. Two statements by President Joe Biden um, and one by the EU Environment Minister basically saying, if you don't have as much ambition in carbon pricing in your industry, we'll have to apply a carbon adjustment to make sure that our workers are not disadvantaged by uh, basically those who are not facing a carbon impost. Now, if you think about Australia, 70% of our produce is exported, particularly in grains and dairy, for example. Um, and Australia has now ranked last on the Climate Change Performance Index, which is the index they'll use to decide which countries do or don't have sufficient policy ambition and therefore apply the border adjustment tariff. Now, th this is very real. Um, I can throw out a lot more examples of, of the G7 planning to have a closed climate club that you, you know, basically to penalise those with insufficient policy ambition and the fact that Australia has actually been named in that. Um, but I would put it to you that we, we face a, a only sort of probably three choices. One is we pay the tax just to access the market. Secondly, we choose not to export to markets that care, uh, which is probably not a palatable option. Or three, we invest money in something like CN30 so that by the time those carbon adjustments are required, we're ready for them. And, and you know, I'm not trying to sell CN30 because, you know, I'm not from MLA. Um, but I think it's just wise stewardship to say we've got to prepare for this. Now, we've got examples where Australia's actually done this. Um, if you look at the canola Western Australian example, um, the Western Australian canola industry were able to access premium markets in the EU because we could demonstrate that canola produced half the emissions in Australia that it did in the EU when they grew it in Europe. So we've already actually shown ambition and access premium markets and we can do it again. Another reason why we should care is that um, there's, these types of reports are coming out. This is a report to the London Stock Exchange from the Farm Animal Investment Risk and Return Report which ranked all the publicly listed livestock companies in the world from good to bad environmental performance, basically in, 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 advising institutional investors of the risk of in, investing in various companies. Now, 
Fonterra came out five from the left on the good side because they had lots of nice words in their sustainability statement. Um, one of the major corporates in Northern Australia came out about fifth from the bad side. And uh, within weeks, we were doing carbon audits across Northern Australia and um, getting them involved in the herd methodology and action on, on, on climate change to change that. Um, but this is, this is why I think we should care. We, we, we find that um, governments are quite tardy and we're having debates at the federal level about whether we do or don't set targets. I would put it to you that train left the station a while back. The supply chain companies you can see on the board there have all set targets that are starting in 2030 that are aiming for emission reductions and are consistent with the Paris Climate Agreement. And unfortunately, the ones with red stars there are picked out recently are the ones that actually have set targets for reducing animal-based protein and increasing plant-based protein. I think that's completely naive because it doesn't recognize that we can do something about livestock methane. But what it brings home is that of the 100 largest economies in the world, 69 are companies, not countries. We're living in a different world where the multinational companies like Microsoft is bigger than half the world's economies. Half the world's countries are smaller than Microsoft. Um, and so it's a different world we're living in and the supply chain are actually setting the rules in this case. Now, uh, it is a bit of chicken and egg in that the you go to the supply chain and they're very nervous about these targets because they don't want to tell farmers what to do. And then the farmers are seeing the supply chain targets and very nervous about being told what to do. Um, but it is, we are headed in that direction. So we've seen the Australian red meat industry strategy, but we've also seen competitors around the world do the same thing. State of Mato Grosso de Sul, set to carbon neutral, including livestock. Um, we've seen the carbon neutral Brazilian beef brand now being marketed in the EU. Between you and me, it's not vaguely carbon neutral. Um, the accounting's quite flawed, but it's a good marketing story. Um, we've seen New Zealand set their climate change bill which incidentally doesn't include a net zero for methane. It includes 40% less methane, but not zero methane, which I think is notable. But we see California put a cap on methane as well. And we've seen the global methane pledge at COP26. Now note that these are all 30 to 40% less methane, which I think is quite indicative because that's about the level of reduction in methane required so that methane matches the ambition of net zero long-lived gases. So quite significant. Um, so let me wrap up, and I've got my animations wrong here, but forgive me for that. Um, and this is where I'm, I'm sort of stepping out of my boundaries of knowledge. I know lots about carbon farming, but nothing about breeding. I, I think it's important to sum up that climate change doesn't mean that suddenly in southern Australia, uh, summer active species will start growing. We, we approach this fairly naively at the beginning, thinking, you know, South Gippsland will suddenly grow Kaikuyu pastures. No, it won't, because climate change doesn't mean it'll start raining in summer in Gippsland. Um, we might get a southward movement of that intermediate zone around Holbrook and around Bega coming around into East Gippsland and therefore be able to grow more kakiyu in that region. So let's get that right at the beginning. But climate change does mean uh, there will be more rainfall variability, uh, more extremes. So we need animals and plants that can cope with that. It does mean hotter summers with uh, warmer winters. So we're seeing ryegrass grow better in winter or the winter active species growing better in winter. So there's opportunities in there for winter active to grow uh, and grow longer in the season. We do see that new transition zone I spoke about. So where you're seeing a southward movement of weather systems and if you were farming in Wagga through to Holbrook through to uh, Corowa, for example, you'd be looking at putting in species that can handle the summer active rainfall as well as the winter rainfall. Um, but uh, in terms of, of, of plant breeding targets, um, for low rainfall regions, we can't just breed deeper roots. That's why I showed you that data earlier. Um, we need to actually look at maybe better um, summer dormancy in Phalaris, for example. Um, deeper roots would work for higher rainfall regions, so if you could put the roots of Kakuyu onto ryegrass, you'd be doing really well. Um, not that you can, of course, not yet. Um, and things like water use efficiency uh, and heat tolerance. Um, and here I put the challenge out because we're still putting a lot of money into perennial ryegrass as a breeding target. And our research would say that in most of southern Australia, by 2050, perennial ryegrass will not actually be a viable species. Uh, so it's a real challenge for where we put, where we put the investment. And I'll come to that in a moment. In terms of mitigation, um, 
it, it's pretty clear a lot of the plant selection has gone. Sorry, it's all plant-based. I'll get on the animals in a moment. Um, uh, it, it's pretty clear we've selected a lot of our species, and I come back to the perennial ryegrass example, where they've been selected for many years under limitless nitrogen. And so we've ended up with this plant that's got far too much nitrogen and not enough energy to, to consume the surplus nitrogen. And that's one of the big greenhouse gas emission problems, is you're getting spring excretion of luxury amounts of urine that is very rich in nitrogen and therefore lots of ammonia, lots of, um, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we should be looking at some of the secondary compounds in our plants. Um, ironically, we probably bred them out over the last hundred years when in actual fact a small amount of tannin, a small amount of saponins in our legumes are starting to show some pretty impressive mitigation results and improve productivity. We can show you great case studies of leukina, for example, put into rose grass pastures where the methane comes down, the animals grow faster, you get a better nitrogen cycle, and you get more soil carbon as a result. Um, New Zealand has bred a few pasture species that have got higher fats and oils in them. Fats and oils are known to reduce methane and improve the metabolizable energy um, and things sec other secondary compounds. Um, and then there's novel compounds we should be thinking about, like bracariolone, which is a root exudate in bracaria that uh, changes the nitrogen cycle in the soil. It actually reduce, it's a natural nitrification inhibitor that is exuded by the roots of, of plants. We know antioxidants reduce heat stress in animals, so we could look at them as targets. On animals, and this is where Rob Banks and I have a, a, a slight difference. Um, I do it in my glasses so I can read this. Um, residual methane, there are two targets we can breed for reduced methane. The one is breeding for an absolute reduction in methane, which is breeding for uh, a residual methane production. I've got a few issues with that. One is it's, it's pretty low heritability. Um, and so it's, it's, it's not going to progress very quickly. Um, we can't develop an offset method to recognize farmers because in year one you get 1%, in year two you get 2%, and it's 10 years before you get 10%. And we struggle to get adoption at 10%, let alone at 1%. That's the one. I suspect that because it's not an imperative for industry to have low methane cattle tomorrow, we're not going to weight it highly in a multi-trait index. Um, and thirdly, if you think about what really drives methane production is rumen passage rate. So the higher the digestibility, the faster it moves through the rumen. The lower the digestibility, the more forage hangs around in the rumen for longer producing methane. And the best indicator we've got from all the research is that we're breeding for an increased rate of passage through the rumen by breeding for residual methane production. This is where you might disagree with me, but that's what we are looking at. So if you're breeding an animal for a feedlot or for a confinement dairy, that might work well, because we're largely ignoring the rumen. But if you're breeding an animal for northern rangeland systems in Australia, then I don't know if this is the right breeding target. In contrast, feed conversion efficiency has a higher heritability. Um, it'll obviously get a higher weight in a multi-trade index. It's already consistent with industry direction. And you do definitely change the methane per unit dry matter production. Um, so you've got an overhead cost of methane, and you've increased productivity over that overhead cost of methane. And I think that is a, a, probably a, a better target long term. Um, and then in terms of adaptation, now I don't know anything about the slick gene, and every time I go looking for it, I'm looking for hard peer-reviewed information, and I just can't find anyone that's done any studies. But Time and again, it comes up as a possible uh, solution. And you know, certainly when you're in long reach and you see black Angus cows with a slick gene out in the middle of the sunshine and the, and the Brahmins hiding under the bushes, you think there's got to be something in this. Um, so someone can comment about that, but I don't know enough. Just to finish off, there's a bit of a challenge about the big picture. Are we actually breeding for the right things, um, the right species for future climates? Um, something that's been hovering in my mind for a long time is you get Femida triandra. Um, uh, uh, what's, what's it called, um, the common name? Kangaroo grass, sorry, because I know the African red grass. Um, it, it grows native in Hobart in Tasmania. It grows native in the Kimberley. It grows in Cape Town native. It grows in the Middle East native. What's the inherent genetic diversity that exists in that species that means it'll be far more resilient to a changing climate and a more variable climate, as opposed to perennial ryegrass, which if you shifted a few degrees outside of the southern coastal region of Victoria, it's 
it's a goner. Um, same as a study I was involved in um, in, in Nguni cattle in Africa, um, that bus tourists definitely outperformed them under good conditions. But when you had them on stones and uh, with high worm burdens and uh, challenging conditions, then they flipped around in terms of which was more adapted to a harsh climate. Um, and so I'll leave you with those thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. We've got five minutes for questions. So we'll go to Slido. We might ignore, uh, ignore the chair question first. So Richard, what are your thoughts on using residual methane in combination of kilograms of beef produced as a selection trait? Yeah, look, I, I think if the two can go together, um, I, I just suspect it might be diet specific. So uh, you could do the two together under good diet conditions, but if you're looking at breeding on rangeland conditions, uh, I'm not sure the two would be compatible as, as, as co-traits. Co um, yes, I, I, I think that'd be the right, right way to go if you were on good quality for forage. Okay, the next question was, what proportion of CN30 targets do you think that genetic improvement for GHG can provide? And that is pretty similar to the chair question, actually. <laughs> yeah, um, look, it, it, it's important as part of a suite of measures. So, you know, we've got a lot of advertising around diet supplements at the moment because they, they're hitting the sort of 70% plus targets. Um, diet supplements around um, grape mark and oils that, that are around the 20%. Breeding is at least in the 15 to 20 percent category um, as, as a cumulative, but you know, one of the earlier presenters made the point. Uh, the difference is you don't have to feed them every day on a supplement that you have to pay for. Um, you know, if you, you know, 1 percent in year one is probably not a very high value target, but 10 percent over 10 years is probably worth chasing. Yeah. I must admit at AAABG I was very impressed with the New Zealand presentation on breeding, breeding for reduced methane or mm. intensity. And, uh, They've made actually quite a lot of progress. So intensity opposed, as opposed to absolute. Intent yeah, because that was my intensity, second yeah, point. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, we have another question there. What what is the relationship between residual methane and feed efficiency? Yeah, it's it's not quite well known because um, they they've always been viewed as either or, um, and I think that goes back to the previous question that suggested you could actually try to couple them. Um, I, I, all I know is that breeding for, resi for residual methane, um, as far as all the evidence I can see is uh, it's about passage rate, which is quite a different target to feed conversion efficiency, which I think is more, you know, someone else in the room knows more about that than I do. Um, so I don't know if that's a good answer, but... <laughs> I think it's sufficient. <laughs> uh, are the Kiwis ahead of us in terms of animal breeding in relation to climate change? Uh, reflecting some of their comments on it. Yeah, uh, look, you know, there's, there's a few more publications out of New Zealand recently on, on sheep in particular. So I think in that respect, they probably have done some more work. Um, as you all know, the, the big problem is where do you get a thousand animals to measure for methane? I mean, it's expensive to measure animals for methane in the first place. The Kiwis have managed to do it over a series of experiments where they have now got over 2,000 sheep all measured for methane more than one time of the year. I mean, you know, that, that's the real financial challenge here. Um, so, so I wouldn't say they, they're ahead of us in terms of progress. I think in terms of getting some gene markers on methane, I think they might have got there with sheep. Um, but I'm not sure that's actually ahead of us. Okay. Uh, right. I might take the second question first. What would you recommend the first steps be for farmers to adopt a CN30 future? Yeah, look, that's a, it's a really important question in that, you know, the, the, the pressure is there to be seen to be doing something, but actually um, it's, it's subtle undertone of the message is hurry up and wait um, because, you know, all the big options are coming through research right now. We've heard about the seaweed, we've heard about 3NOP, the, you know, the... There are options emerging, but the actual market signals are not strong just yet. Um, so I think there, there's two messages here. One is adoption of current best practice. So um, reducing unproductive animal numbers, um, improving herd health, all the obvious things to actually get efficiency and emissions intensity under control. Then look at 
where do legumes fit in your system? Can you bring in novel legumes? Like if you're in Northern Australia, can you bring in Leucina or Desmanthus? Can you bring in Desmodium? If you're in Southern Australia, can you bring in Crown Vetch? Can you bring in Lotus um, as part of your management system? And then you're, you've, you've sort of done the 20% options already. Um, and then it's a case of sit back and wait for the seaweed option to be available to the great extensive grazing industries or the vaccine to be available for more industries. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm going to need to just do one more question. Uh, it's a case of which? I'll let you choose. Um, maybe the middle one. Has anyone overlaid river delta bed core samples over the historical records since settlement to gain long-term trend data on CC? Joe? Carbon yeah, credits, I should. Yeah, look, on, on climate change. Climate um, change. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there's, a, there's a lot of those studies have been done. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, tree rings, uh, sediment levels, uh, ice core rings, they all tell us the same story. The moment you go back to certain areas, you'll find um, that, that we are in unprecedented precedented territory. Um, so, you know, there, there's, a, there's a tree rings in a tree in Tasmania that's over 10,000 years old, an old Huon pine. Same story comes out of that, out of um, uh, ice cores in both Antarctic and, uh, and the Arctic. Um, and sediment beds would tell us the same story. Okay. I'd like you to put your hands together for Richard. Excellent.